Ingrid said, uh, today is about bears. And uh, if you'll just bear with me while I tell you the story of bears, uh, we will get on with it. First of all, what is a bear? Uh, they're genealogically in the order carnivora. Uh, that's the same order that it contains uh, cats like lions and tigers and fluffy kitty, as well as uh, wolves and coyotes and Fido the dog. But the family we're going to be uh, talking about today is your Sadie. And they're the bears. There are three subfamilies, two of which only have one bear each, uh, the giant panda and a speckled bear, and then a subfamily often referred to as real bears that have six species in it. Um, the, uh, both the uh, brown and polar and American and Asiatic black bear and the sun and the sloth bear. Basically, they're just large furry animals with big claws. And that's one of the things you have to be aware of. They've been around a long, long time. They hobnobbed uh, with saber-toothed cats, woolly mammoth, uh, mastodons, cave lions, etc. But they were here a lot, lot longer than that. Uh, the original tracking of bears came around 46 uh, million years ago and lasted for, this animal lasted for about to 1.8 million years ago. And when you see the MYA as a designation, stands for million years ago, you might see BYA for a billion years ago, and YA, which is usually following some thousand years ago. The reason I do that is so you don't have to do the mathematics of when I say BC or AD and add them together and all the other things. So this is kind of a convenience uh, way that now much of the history of uh, the earth and so forth is uh, designated. Now the bear dog, uh, the bears branched off rather quickly from the bear dog and the bear dog then spent millions of years becoming a wolf. So after all, the bears uh, ended up in uh, about 37 million years ago. This little critter uh, ended up, he was very small, about cat size, and went on over those millions of years to finally end up being one of the largest a mammal, carnivorous, ever to walk Earth. Uh, one of the earliest bears that there are a fair amount of fossil evidence were the early cave bear. Uh, not a lot known about why they went extinct, but at about the time they went extinct, the more common cave bear that we often hear about came into existence. Uh, what we know about them, they were large and they were probably very uh, carnivorous in the fact that they probably preyed on other animals primarily. Now, two of the ancient bears no longer with us was, as I mentioned, the newer cave bear. That's the bear that was featured in that series of novels some of you may have read about the clan of the cave bear uh, came around about 2.6 2 million years ago and hung around till about 24,000 years ago. Now, cave bear was in competition with Homo sapiens for resources and apartments. And uh, the Homo sapiens hunted them. However, a, I don't believe because of the number of humans at that point that they would have ever driven the bear to extinction, but about 24,000 years ago, there was a uh, global uh, 
ice sheet that covered most of the North American continent, and that uh, was the coup de grace of the uh, cave bear. About the same time, emerging in South America about two and a half million years ago, and lasting until about 11,000 years ago, when many animals went extinct, uh, the saber-toothed cat, the mammoth, et cetera, uh, that animal ended up being the largest carnivorous mammal ever to walk Earth. 3,000 to 3,500 pounds. When it stood on its hind legs, it would be 11 to 12 feet tall. That animal no longer exists, but when we start looking at the bears that we have today, we'll see that there is one lone survivor from that group, uh, the speckled bear, uh, also known as the South American black or Andean bear. It's uh, the last of the short-faced bear. That was that huge bear that went extinct about 11,000 years ago. Lives in the Andes Mountains of South America. Uh, his, the bat bear is about what most bears are, medium size, uh, up to about 350 pounds for a male, uh, somewhat less for females, and 95% uh, vegetarian. So the diet has changed over the years. Uh, the earlier bears probably were meat eaters exclusively. Uh, they're endangered, and you'll hear this throughout this presentation, uh, due to poaching or habitat loss. Uh, that is one of the major crises facing bears. Uh, populations probably less than 2,000, uh, 20,000, and uh, that's difficult to really pin down because uh, where they live and uh, the nations really don't have a lot of incentive to count the bears. Another of the day's bear, that other subfamily with one bear, is the giant panda. And uh, native to China, as you probably all know, lives in the high bamboo forest of China. It's among the world's most rare living mammals with about 1,500 left in the wild. Uh, 49 of them live outside of China in 13 countries. Uh, but they all belong to China. No one owns a panda, giant panda. China has loaned those to zoos. They're all in zoos. And they're part of uh, breeding programs that China, once the uh, cub is born and can leave its uh, mother, it's returned to China and placed in their breeding program. Uh, diet consists of bamboo exclusively. And a male or a large uh, adult panda will eat about 25 pounds of bamboo a day. So if you're a zookeeper and you have a breeding pair, that you got to come up with 50 pounds of bamboo every day. Uh, that's not an easy chore because bamboo doesn't grow everywhere. And so obviously that's a challenge. But they are probably one of the most popular animals in any zoo. And when a youngster is born and brought out, the lines are immense waiting to see that young fella. Again, medium size, about the same as uh, the speckled bear. Uh, threatened by habitat loss. And China is being very aggressive in trying to maintain this population and expand it. And they're opening up a national park twice the size of Yellowstone for the uh, trying to bring into it a breeding of the panda in the wild. One of the problems faced by the panda is its low reproduction rate. Unlike the other bears, pandas are fertile for only a few days each year. So mating must occur during that short period. And like other bears, the young, when they're born, are very fragile. Uh, they, if they do, in fact, survive uh, in the wild, they are uh, easily subject to predation by uh, other animals. So that really distracts 
uh, from the ability to uh, increase their population. And here's even a more rare subspecies of the giant panda. Uh, the quinoline panda you can notice that he is brown and beige, not black and white. Lives up in the quinoline uh, mountains of China, high bamboo forest again. Uh, they also have the same problem with breeding. And uh, inbreeding, of course, is a major issue when you have only two to 300. Suspect that uh, the quinoline panda is not long for, uh, before it'll be extinct. Now, let's take a look at the real bears. Uh, as I said, there are six real bears. I know there's only four in this picture, but just <laughs> look. But before we see the bears, let's talk a little about what they are. Most are omnivores. That means they eat anything that they can find, except for the polar bear that's exclusively a carnivore. Uh, not very many plants growing up there in the Arctic. Uh, they're induced ovulators with delayed implantation of the fertilized ovum. Isn't that interesting? Now, what does that mean? It means that during the time a bear is fertile, except for the panda, it uh, can be mated, and once it mates, the egg is released, and when it becomes fertilized, it doesn't implant on the uterus until some time after when the bear actually goes to den, so that it can continue to function, eat, put on weight, and so forth, although it's pregnant and has a fertilized ovum. And because they're induced ovulators, they may be mated with two, three, maybe even four males so that the offspring would be fathered by different males. Uh, they don't, uh, hi they're not hibernators. Uh, hibernation technically is a state in which the temperature and the heart rate is lower to a point of near death. And that's not what bears do. Uh, there are animals and some even plants that do something similar, although they don't have a heartbeat. Uh, they go into a deep sleep, a torpor. Uh, during that period of time, they don't eliminate. There's no urination, there's no feces passed. Uh, they can be awakened during that state, go out, come back in, go back to, it's in the uh, southern reaches where there are bears, they, there's not a winter period where they go into their den. They'll probably den up during the rainy season, but they also go into that deep sleep. Now, polar bears, except for the female that's pregnant, don't den up during uh, the period of time. In fact, their, their summer time on land, uh, they go into a walking hibernation. They lower their heart rates. Uh, when they move about, they move at a very steady, slow gait, uh, and they're conserving energy, but they don't go into that deep sleep. Uh, cubs of a bear, as I mentioned with uh, the giant panda, are small, one, one and a half pounds. Uh, when they come out of the den with their mom, they're 20 to 30 pounds. So the amount of high fat content milk that has to be produced, which may be for two or three cubs during that period, requires that the bear have substantial energy resources when it goes into the den and stays there for five to six mo months without eating. Uh, cubs will stay with uh, their mom two to three years. Interestingly, when food is good, they stay longer, three years. Uh, mom kicks them out of the house pretty quick when there's no food around so she can regain her resources and so forth, and they're out on their own. Okay, 
Uh, three of the uh, real bears are kind of lesser known. We don't hear a lot about them. One of them is the sun bear, referred to often as the honey bear. Uh, Southeast Asia lowlands, again, a warm climate bear. Smallest of all the bears, about 100 pounds for, uh, to 150 pounds for a male. Uh, they're vulnerable to habitat loss and poaching. Uh, population is probably less than a thousand. Uh, however, they're subject to bear farming. And don't think of an idyllic setting where bears are romping around and having fun. Bear farming is when captured bear, which are often bred in captivity, are kept in small cages. It's uh, common in both China and Vietnam. And the bear then has a stent placed into its gallbladder so the bile can be harvested because people in those areas think that bear bile is a medical uh, treatment for many things. So China has said it's eliminated bear farming. I kind of doubt that when how big a China is in rural areas. Vietnam uh, hasn't outlawed the practice. They're being very humane, though. They no longer allow metal stints because they cause too much pain. They just use a plastic stint now. Okay, Asiatic black bear, again, one of the lesser known bears, lives up in the Himalayas. A uh, little bigger than some of the other bears, maybe up to 400 pounds. We don't know how many there are because First of all, they live in very rugged territories, which is hard to get a count. And the nations they live in probably are not that much inclined to even try to do scientific counts of the number. There might be 40,000 in the world or so somewhat less. Uh, habitat loss, as uh, most of the bears are subject to. The nickname is the moon bear. And that's because native uh, of those countries think that white blaze on the chest looks like a rising moon. Uh, leave that to your imagination if you can figure that out. Uh, they're primary vegetarians, uh, eat very little meat, and if it is, it's probably insects or grubs and stuff like that. And finally, the last of the lesser known bears, the sloth bear. Uh, India and the surrounding countries such as Pakistan, uh, again, a uh, little larger than some of the medium-sized bears, up to 425 for a male. Uh, females might go to 275. They're the shaggiest of the bears. Now, that's fairly obvious if you look at the picture. And uh, it's kind of interesting because they were named a sloth bear. First of all, they were thought at first to be giant sloths because they are great tree climbers and they would be up in the trees of course, uh, further examination showed they were a bear, but that tidal sloth uh, stuck with them. And uh, their habitat, of course, is being lost and degraded. Uh, probably less than 10,000. And these bears are often used for dancing bears. And I'll talk more about dancing bears a little bit later on in this presentation. Now, the big three of the real bear category of six, of course, the North American black bear, the brown bear, and the polar bear. Not the white bear, but the polar bear. Well, some facts about these bears. The black bear, there are more black bears than any other bear in the world, about 600,000. Uh, they're not all black but they're all, they are all uh, biologically black bears. Uh, again, about 450 pounds, a good size, medium-sized bear. They live in 44 of our 50 states in Canada and northern Mexico, but the northern Mexico population is uh, very small. Of uh, the six states that don't have black bears, of course, Hawaii is one, and then the other uh, are the Midwest Plains states, and that's bears are 
forest creatures, basically, and so therefore they're not really substantial uh, forest in places in the plain states. Primarily eat vegetation, although if their habitat isn't around streams where there are fish, particularly migrating salmon, uh, then they're very much into that. Uh, and they also can take small mammals and so forth. But like most bears, except for the polar bear, they primarily eat uh, vegetation. Uh, some of the subspecies are critically threatened. One of them is the Louisiana black bear, and that's totally due to loss of habitat. And, uh, but again, a sizable population with 600,000. Here's a picture of a white black bear from uh, British Columbia. Here's a cinnamon and a golden black bear found up in uh, the Rocky Mountains, Colorado, other Rocky Mountain states. And the glacier bear, or AKA the blue bear, found in coastal Alaska and southwest Alaska. And the uh, case, you know, when I first looked at that picture, I thought it didn't have any ears, but the ears are totally black and bound into the back. So it, it looks like any other bear if you saw it in reality. Again, all of these color variations are due to recessive color genes. When a male and a female have that recessive gene and breed, then they throw a cub with the uh, non-black color. Otherwise, they come out black. OK, brown bear. Uh, most widely distributed bear, uh, only two, there are 200,000, so it's a sizable population. But they are in uh, Northern Hemisphere and Eurasia, so they span the globe further than any other bear. They're a good-sized bear. Uh, males going up to some 700 pounds. Um, diet varies on location. If a bear is in an area where there are a substantial amount of fish, uh, or in an area where they're on coastal, where they can dig shellfish, uh, they'll put a lot of that into their diet. Uh, if they're in a place where it's primarily vegetation, they'll be eating sedges, berries, and any other type of vegetarian. Several of the subspecies uh, of, uh, are endangered, and uh, there are probably more subspecies, 14, than any other bear because of their uh, global reach and geographical areas end up with populations that end up into a subfamily, a uh, subspecies, excuse me. Uh, in North America, people often refer to the brown bear as the grizzly bear, which is actually just one of the subspecies. Here's a picture of a Himalayan brown bear. It's estimated to less than 200 left, and it's probably one of the brown bears that'll be extinct in a very short time. Here's a black brown bear, and he looks pretty healthy, and he's eating berries, by the way. And here's a uh, mom brown bear ready to protect her cubs. Most interactions between humans and bears that result in bad outcomes, mostly for the human, is uh, because of interaction with a female that has cubs. Uh, that is one of the issues that people should be mindful of anytime they're out in the wild, is uh, don't fool with a cub. If you see one, uh, mom's not going to like that. OK, polar bears. That's the largest of our bears still uh, existing. Uh, males up to 1,500 pounds. Uh, when they stand up, they're about eight feet tall. Uh, the range is circumpolar around the North Pole. Primary diet is seals, although they also eat walrus or carrion a whale that dies and washes up on shore. Uh, they're great swimmers and great smellers. Uh, just take a look at that left paw of that bear, and you can see what kind of paddle it would make. 
They uh, swim with their front legs only. They trail their rear legs behind them. They can swim for up to 24 hours between ice flows. Uh, smelling, they can smell seals under the ice. They can smell a dead whale on shore five miles away. So that is part of their uh, makeup. And they're not white. Uh, their fur is translucent, and refraction makes them look white. And they have black skin. So any sunlight that might penetrate is absorbed in that black skin. About 25,000, they're vulnerable. Many scientists uh, predicting that they will be extinct in the next uh, 40 to 50 years. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. I think probably there would still be a few isolated uh, places where there might be uh, polar bears past that point, but not very much longer. Here's a bear, a polar bear cub at birth, probably pound, pound and a half. Look the size of the bear uh, next to mom's paw. And uh, it is no fur. That bear, then female bear, must nurse that cub, and there may be two or three from that weight till 20 to 5, 30 pounds. And after about five, six months, there comes the bear out of the cub. The cub's coming out of its den. Cute little fella. Well, the question is that the bear might ask us is, why am I going extinct? And if you look at this picture, it tells part of that story. The lack of sea ice uh, is one of the major uh, problems facing the bear population. And in summary, it's climate change in humans, and I would almost say humans. I'm well aware that there are natural causes in climate change, but the accelerated change in our climates, uh, ra rising temperatures, starting with the Industrial Revolution, is done by humans. Uh, the 5% that don't believe that, OK. Uh, anyway, that is reducing ice coverage, and so the bear's food uh, source is diminishing. I mean, it's a simple formula, less ice, less time to hunt, and less seals to eat. Uh, females' ability to successfully reproduce becomes diminished. If they don't have enough fat content, when they den up to take that little bear cub that we saw in the picture and change it into a 25 to 30 pound, 30 pound bear so it can survive, then the reproduction or the loss of those bears uh, is quite substantial. In the best of circumstances, polar bear is born, only 50% ever reach five years of age when they are then uh, sexually mature. So best of circumstances, there's a great drop off or death of young bears, and uh, that will only increase. Uh, hunting is also an issue. Canada allows trophy hunting of bears, 500, 600 bears a year killed in Canada. Uh, this young fellow is showing his ability with his high-tech bow there, having shot that bear with an arrow. Uh, hunting uh, in the United States is no longer allowed. With the Endangered Species Act listed the polar bear as threatened. It stopped the hunting in Alaska. Uh, the current administration is in the process of rewriting the Endangered Species Act. It will take an act of Congress, of course, to pass it, but their, their approach is that it's not been successful because we haven't been able to delist many animals. Conservationists will say, Yes, that's true, but we also have prevented the extinction of many animals. So we'll see what happens. 
if that happens, they may open up hunting again in uh, Alaska. Okay, switching away from that, let's take a look at how us sapiens uh, interact with the bears, the Yersanes. First question is, are bears dangerous to us sapiens? And of course they are. But let's take a look at the statistics. Uh, there are about two to five sapiens killed a year by bears. Unfortunately, last Saturday, there was a person killed in the Grand Teton uh, Yellowstone area. It was a hunting guide who was coming down with his part, with his client, and they were bringing out an elk they had killed and were attacked by a, uh, an adult cub or an older cub, maybe three years old, and its mom, and he was killed. Uh, those two bears have been euthanized at this point, but it does happen. But wolves kill eight to 10 a year. Uh, dogs, 20 to 30, if you don't count the 30,000 worldwide who die of rabies from dog bites. And then we, in the United States, our sapiens end up killing 17,250 in 2016. Uh, so who does the most killing of human beings? It's certainly not bears or wild animals. My second question would be, are sapiens dangerous to bears? And I think they're a great deal more dangerous to bears than they are to us. That happens to be a plate of uh, British soldiers hunting a sloth bear in India. Okay, I mentioned bear dancing. Great entertainment uh, practice in Eastern Europe, uh, Pakistan, some other countries where a bear seems to be dancing to music played by his handler. Uh, here's a picture. And why does that bear dance? Well, it dances because to put a rope up through its nostrils and out, and any time it doesn't perform, extreme pain. Uh, you guys and gals who have ever been hit in the nose know what it might feel like. So, what else do we do? Well, in bear baiting in Elizabethan times, and uh, Queen Elizabeth attended these events, uh, a bear is tethered, dogs are then allowed to harass and eventually kill that bear. Bear can't fight back because it's tied up. But don't think it's just about Elizabethan times. Here's a picture of bear baiting in Pakistan now. You can see a happy audience in the background watching the entertainment. But not to be outdone, here's one in South Carolina. In uh, 2016, several people were arrested for bear baiting, but I think that probably still goes on in rural uh, areas of Appalachia. And then all of you out there probably either had kids or grandkids during the Davy Crockett era, uh, when coonskin caps were all the rage, and there was the ballad, and since I don't sing well, I'll cite it. Brown, born on a mountaintop in Tennessee, greatest state in the land of the free. Raised in woods so he knew every tree. Killed him a bear when he was only three. Wonderful, wonderful thing to teach our kids. Get us ready to go hunting. Well, here's some bear hunting facts. Uh, there are a lot of black bears, 600,000 but 40,000 are legally killed each year uh, in the United States. 28 states allow bear hunting. 18 of them allow bear hounding. Hound, bear hounding is when you use hounds to chase the bear and run bear up to a tree and then the hunter can come along and kill it. Uh, 10 states allow uh, baiting of bears. That's different than bear baiting I talked about a moment ago. That's putting out bait to attract a bear to a given location 
and then when it learns to come to that location, the hunter can kill it. Uh, Oregon has banned both uh, hunting with hounds and baiting of bears. The brown and the grizzly bear, Alaska is the only state that now allows hunting of uh, brown bears, about 1,200 killed each year, 70% of that by trophy hunters, out-of-state residents. Uh, Canada, British Columbia is about 330 annually, but interestingly, uh, this year, at the end of this year, uh, British Columbia has uh, banned trophy hunting in the future. Uh, Yukon and Northwest Territories still allow trophy hunting. Uh, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming <coughs> considered hunting in 2018, first time in 43 in the lower 48 states. Uh, that's because the grizzly bear has been taken off the Endangered uh, Species Act. There are probably 700 to 750 uh, brown bears in the Yellowstone area. Uh, unfortunately, the bears do not understand where the border is. There's no big fence or anything. So they wander out, and those are the states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming where they wander. Uh, they met with a lot of protests over the decision to go and allow hunting of those bears. Uh, there was a federal lawsuit filed by Native Americans. Right now, uh, there is a temporary injunction against the hunting. Uh, Montana had backed off and decided not to have a hunt but Wyoming and Idaho had already issued the uh, hunting uh, permits, but that's now on hold for another seven days. Uh, not sure when the judge will make a final decision. Well, that's enough about our interaction. Uh, just to show you a few pictures, here's the manly sport of bear hunting, a group of uh, hunters proudly displaying their trophies. Not to be outdone, a womanly sport. Uh, she's uh, showing off the black bear she's killed. But now let's take a quick look and move away from that into uh, a short history of the world. Uh, four and a half billion years ago, Earth was created, about nine years, nine billion years after uh, the Big Bang. Uh, life began about three and a half billion years ago uh, in the sea. Uh, 500 million years ago, plants appeared on land. 440 million years ago, marine life migrated onto land. 240 million years ago, first animals began to appear. And 160 million years ago, mammals appeared on Earth. Now, what happened during that period of time? Natural phenomenon triggered five mass extinctions. Uh, they occurred between 240 million years ago to 68 million years ago. They were caused by uh, natural things, glaciation due to cooling of the Earth, atmospheric changes, uh, oxygen replacing carbon, for example. Volcanic eruptions would block out the sun. Uh, causing global warming, astronaut, astronaut strikes. Uh, that's one of the things that people think did away with the dinosaurs. Um, during those five extinctions, any time, 95% to 75% of life forms were extinguished. And then evolution resulted in uh, new life forms, uh, including vertebrates. Uh, Don showed us a uh, TED Talk mentioned that we're all related to fishes, which were the first vertebrae. Uh, eventually, uh, humans emerged about two and a half uh, million years ago in Africa. And then sapiens came along about 195,000 years ago. And we kept coming and coming and coming ever since. 
in the year 1500, there were a half billion or 500 million uh, Homo sapiens on Earth. Uh, in 300 years, there's one billion. Uh, by now, uh, there are 7.6 billion of us. And projections by the UN are that by 20, the turn of the century, there'll be 11.2 billion Homo sapiens. Uh, question is whether the Earth's carrying capacity uh, is sufficient to support that. Uh, that can be a major debate. Technology has been able to keep up with the growth of uh, Homo sapiens through inventing new or coming up with new energy sources, food sources, etc. We'll see. Uh, it's also possible that we'll figure out how to kill ourselves in that period of time. So what have we done? Well, we go back to 12,000 years ago, human beings made up 1% of the weight of vertebrae land animals. I know that's a strange measurement, but you just can't count animals because of the size differential, et cetera. And 99% of the weight of vertebrae and were, uh, wild, land animals were wild animals. And then what happened? Well, about that time, Homo sapiens stopped being, being uh, hunter-gatherers with the domestication of grains such as rice and wheat and animals. And today, animals make up one, wild animals make up 1% of the weight of vertebrate land animals. 99% are humans, farm animals, and our pets. So what happens to the existing 1% of uh, animals on Earth? Well, there is a mass, six mass extinction going on. Uh, I know that's debatable. There are some books written about that, but it's estimated at this point that 150 to 200 plants, insects, birds, fish, amphibians, and mammals become extinct every day. Uh, of those animals that lived 40 years ago, 40% have been lost. Uh, in 1970 to 2012, those that exist, the animals that existed in 1970, 58% have been lost at this time. Major causes, climate change, deforestation, habitat loss, uh, fragmentation, degradation, acid, for example, acidification of oceans. Today, in fact, if you read the local paper with a discussion about how oxygen depletion is becoming a normal cycle every year, in the Pacific Oceans, that's when, uh, particularly at the lower depths, there was not sufficient oxygen to sustain the animals that live there, and crabs, for example, are dying. So we can look at that as an issue. So my question is, is there end near? Well, I know my end is here. So I can barely wait for your questions. And um, just a quick announcement. We have 10 minutes of questions. We have to take the break from 25 after till 25 to the hour because of the following session. Sharon, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, yesterday I was at the Oregon Zoo and they have this really large polar bear exhibit they're redoing. And I don't know if you're familiar with zoos and the Oregon Zoo. Is there any chance that that's going to help at all? Or is this habitat the main deal and just kind of uh, enjoy think it? That. I don't believe that, that zoo animals uh, breeding programs, which have been successful, uh, the uh, California condor is an example, but not for large mammals, first bringing that animal back into the wild, and if it's 
uh, habitat is degraded and there is not sufficient sea ice, it's not going to help. There'll probably be uh, polar bears to take your kids or great 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 grandkids to see. This is Wayne. I recently read of a polar bear that was tracked by satellite, a uh, female of a cub. She went 400 miles uh, to reach pack ice in 11 days. And then when she got back to the mainland, she was without out her cub. But 400 miles of swimming in 11 days. Yeah, you know, hunting of seals is a uh, full-time event for polar bear. The polar bears are pretty good eaters. Uh, they kill a seal, they'll eat 150 pounds in one meal. But that still is an issue of uh, having enough sea ice because the seal depends on the sea ice for breeding and it's below the sea ice when it's caught. So when there is less sea ice and more open water, there are less seals. And yeah, it's a big job to go and get enough seals to withstand and bring your weight. All right here, Irene. Um, so I've heard that because of the loss of ice for the polar bear, some of them are coming into the land and interbreeding with the brown bear. And I wondered, and they become a hybrid type bear. Is that the future? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I, there are more grizzly or brown bears in polar bear territory. 2016, a trophy hunter killed a hybrid bear, uh, a polar brown bear. Uh, that brown bears and black bears have mated and thrown hybrid. Uh, unlike a mule, uh, bears that are hybrid are fertile and can rebreed. So whether we're developing another uh, subspecies along that line, uh, only time would tell, but it would have to go fairly rapidly because of the rapidity of uh, climate change impact and melting of the sea ice. Most evolutionary changes take a lot longer than 50 or 60 years, so that may, but there is that activity going on now. Charlene, uh, I had a college friend who lived in San Diego and became very familiar with the polar bears that were in the zoo there. And she got to visit a lot and the, and the zoo people let her come more and more often. And she got to the point where she was in with them, they, they loved her and they hugged her and she hugged them and everything. Then they, the bears went back to China and five years later she made the trip back to China to visit the bears. And when she got to the place where they were being kept, which was quite a humane place with lots of bamboo and open spaces, they heard her voice and they came running to her and they grabbed her and it was like they'd never been apart. Yeah, the, the, the giant panda you're talking about. And those, I remember when some young were born at the DC Zoo and came out, and I happened to be in Washington at the time, you couldn't get near the exhibit because there were so many people to see them. Uh, they're a tremendous attraction to the zoo, and uh, attraction to the zoo means money, basically, because a lot of people buy tickets. And, uh, but China has a great uh, breeding program, but it's in a captive breeding program, and what they're trying to do is move that giant panda into a wild environment and have a natural breeding program. Good morning, Lester. Thank you for your presentation. I uh, have a theory. The word hibernation yeah. should be changed to exhaustion for a mother bear that has to take care of those kids. I think she just collapses and sleeps for the five or six months <laughs> because she's absolutely exhausted. <laughs> well. Again, you know, hibernation means near death, so I'm not sure <laughs> a deep sleep would be pleasant most of the time. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is Danny. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about the uh, bears and the salmon in the Columbia River and how that might be managed. 
I'm, I'm sorry, my hearing is not the best. The, the competition between bears and salmon in the Columbia River oh, and how, the, how I, that might be managed. I have no idea how we will manage uh, both, say, the tern, the bird that eats a lot of them, and bears eating them. Uh, we know that we have a critical problem with salmon. There is a new compact being developed between Canada and the uh, northern Oregon and Washington State to restrict the amount of salmon caught in the wild because of diminishing. We know we have orchids who are starving to death because of lack of salmon. It's a tremendous problem, and we're not going to remove all the dams, so I'm not quite sure how that works out. And uh, yeah, the bears do eat them. Uh, Primarily, a lot of uh, pictures that you see are taken in Alaska of bears catching uh, salmon and eating them. And that population is still fairly healthy, but uh, I don't have any clue, nor do I think most people have how to restore salmon. Lester Joel over here, right here. Yeah. I know you're an avid photographer, and I was just curious, were any of these photo uh, photographs yours? Yes. Well, first of all, uh, I didn't uh, draw any of the pictures of the cave bears or those types, nor did I take the pictures of the uh, sloth bear or the giant panda or so forth. Most of the pictures of uh, black, brown, and with the exception of the glacier and the uh, cinnamon bear, which I have never seen in my so I didn't take those two pictures, but most of the polar bear brown and black other pictures, including that white black bear, which is one of 400 in the world, uh, I've took those pictures. So yeah, quite a few of them. Lester, this is Ruthann. Going back to these pictures, how did, did you have a particular person that took you to where these bears were? How did you find them? You have wonderful pictures. Well, I, you know, you go out in the wild someplace, and I saw some of your pictures, uh, and you go to a location, you have, th there are three things that result in good wildlife pictures. One is being in a location where the animals exist, uh, having them present themselves, and then having the equipment and the technique to take the picture. And if you combine those and you work them out, you can get some pretty good pictures. But it takes a lot of travel. Uh, going to India to photograph a uh, Bengal tiger, the flight out of New York is 17 hours to start with. You know? So you, know, you really have to put a lot of time and effort into it. And you have to know what you're doing. But the best thing you can do if you're an amateur is go with a good uh, group that specializes in wildlife photography. Well, Lester, we're really glad that you didn't smell very good to them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yeah.